morning. It's 9.45 and time to start this morning. So grab your hymn books, your majesty hymn books this morning. Number 313 this morning, number 313. Of course, this, tomorrow's Independence Day. We're thinking a lot about our country this weekend, but ultimately our home is in heaven, correct? So let's sing We're Marching to Zion this morning. Number 313 in your hymn books. We're marching to Zion. Number 313. Come we. This morning, brother Josh, good to see you back this morning. Would you, uh, yes, would you lead us in prayer this morning? Yes, Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege to come together to worship you. We pray that you cleanse our hearts and our minds from every evil thought, every evil word, every evil desire and motive. Wash us in the blood of Christ, Lord God. Make us clean, Lord, and meet with us today, Lord God, and teach us, Lord. Show us wonderful things out of your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, and for Christ's sake, amen. 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 Remember, teens, you're staying up here. Take your Bibles, the book of Romans, chapter 12, this morning, the book of Romans, chapter 12. And uh, we're going to be continuing on this thing of teaching the... Spiritual gifts. We're looking at the gift of teaching. Uh, we've looked at prophecy, and uh, this morning we're going to look. We last week actually spent last week on this, and I want to continue and finish up this one this week in Romans chapter 12, preaching through the book of Romans. And um, does anybody need one of these understanding spiritual gifts? Don't have one. Maybe wasn't here last week. Don't have one. 
if you uh, need one, while I flag your hand, they've got them back there. Just flag your hand and kind of let them know that they'll get your way there. Uh, guys, I may be asking you to put a few scriptures up on the wall as we go along this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I want to give a couple of verses that uh, I want to really focus on this morning. And one of them is 1 John 2. And I believe we'll, be, we'll go through verse 25 through 27. And then 1 Corinthians um, chapter 2. And I think maybe verses th uh, 14 through 16. All right, now, <clears throat> last week we talked about teaching. What is teaching? Uh, why, does, why do we need teaching? What, uh, what constitutes teaching? And we talked about several things. But I want to just say <clears throat> this before we get going. That every person needs to learn how to read. Now, I want to say something to you this morning. You may not know how to, I'm telling you, it shocks me, the kids that are graduating out of schools today and cannot read. Right. All right. Uh, in order to learn how to read, you need, you need to learn phonics. That's the pronunciation of, of uh, did I spell it wrong? Probably spelled it wrong. Anyway, you need phonics. And uh, you need, and here's a big thing about reading. And that's comprehension. Now let me say something to you. <clears throat> Our forefathers uh, set forth, even in this, in this state, it's required, it's law about ed, uh, uh, education. They wanted people to learn how to read. They knew this, that in the dark ages, most people, they kept people from reading the Bible. Yep. If they kept you from reading the Bible, they could keep you enslaved. Right. All right? So it's important to know how to read. Now I want to say something to you this morning. I've I was very fortunate to have a, a teacher in the first grade who taught phonics very well. And, and between my mother and her and my dad, uh, I cr they created a desire to read in me. It's like the world would open up. And so I read every book I could get my hands on in first and second grade. Uh, my mom and my dad read the Bible to us uh, in family devotions. And I realized that reading... W could just expand my world just you know and I and I also know that I can look back now and see that God had planned for me to preach and he wanted me to know how to you're going to you're going to preach but good idea to know how to read the Bible because you're supposed to preach the word yeah. now there's we're going to be looking but here's what I want to say to you <clears throat> you may have graduated from school or didn't graduate from school but that can't that does not necessarily keep you from reading I'll make you this commitment we have a phonics reading program here at our school that we would be glad to share with you from your home. If you just work with us a little bit, we can get you on a phonics pronunciation program and have you reading in six months fluently. Okay, if, if you'll try, if you'll, if you'll try, if you're interested, all right? <clears throat> There's a reason for the dumbing down of America. That's right. yeah. They do not want people to know how to read or comprehend what they're reading. That's right. Now, let me say something about reading the Bible. And we're going to look at this a minute. The Bible is spiritually understood. Until you get saved. Now, yes, there's basic things there you can read and understand. There's lost people who read the Bible and they just read it for, you know, antagonistic purposes and so forth. <clears throat> but to get, to get a hold of spiritual truth, you have to have the Holy Spirit enlightening your, your, your eyes, the eyes of your understanding is what the Bible calls it. Now, but I want to just say, first of all, uh, when we're talking about teaching, every parent ought to make sure that your child knows how to read. Amen. Do not expect your teacher to, to be the one who teaches them. Sure, they're going to teach them and everything, but you be sure your child is learning it. Do not let your child grow up and get to the fourth grade or fifth grade level not knowing how to read. That's your responsibility as a parent. Not my responsibility, it's not your teacher's responsibility, it's not grandma's responsibility, it's your responsibility as a parent to make you say, well, uh, I, I don't, what, even if it's ale, uh, delegating that responsibility to someone, you better be sure that person you delegated that responsibility to is teaching them how to read. And uh, pronunciation. If you can learn phonics, there's not a word in that Bible or anywhere else that you cannot figure out how it is pronounced, Okay. Another thing that needs to be done when we're learning is, is uh, it, the class that we have here at this school is called word building. Okay? And what that means is, and 
it means it, it's, it's, it goes on the, on the subject of vo vocabulary. Now, let me tell you something. We've got about, I would say there's 60 to 80 percent of people who are sitting in a Senate seat in the United States Senate in a congressional seat and do not, <clears throat> do not know, haven't read the Constitution. And if they've read it, they have no respect for it, no comprehension to it, nothing, much less the Bible. Okay? Now, we're living in a generation that's woefully ignorant of Scripture, and you cannot, the, the Bible says that fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if you don't have the fear of the Lord through, your, through a knowledge of Scripture, you don't know who God is and what he is like and all of his characteristics, you can't even begin to have true knowledge. <clears throat> Information is one thing. You can sit, watch pornography all day long, but are, is that making you smart? You might have information, but you're not. And begin, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. And the Bible teaches, last week we talked about Deuteronomy, to teach them diligently unto thy children. And so in this church, I can't help what's happening on the other side of Missouri or in Kansas or Arkansas, but I can, as the pastor of this church, challenge you and encourage you to make sure that your families know how to read. If you don't know how to read, a preacher can tell you anything. Politician can tell you anything. And you don't know no different. And so I'm just, uh, while we're on this gift of teaching, I want to hammer this in. Now, I'm, I'll tell you right now, I'd be the last person. Don't, do not, <clears throat> you may not have <coughs> had what many people get. Listen, I know, of, I, I know specifically people that are friends of mine who graduated from the schools around here in this county. They can't read and comprehend. You can't do it. The reason I know that because some of them have applied for jobs. They've talked to me. You, you, you start doing something with them. They say, Reggie, I'll I, be honest with you. I can't. And, but you graduated? Yeah. Now that's, that's a crime against our children. It's a crime against the children. But here, like I say, we want to, word building is where you build your vocabulary. And that is you study what words are. And you learn and you build your vocabulary. Building your vocabulary. If you will read the writings of the founding fathers and people, not just the founding fathers, but the average citizen in America in the 1700s, their vocabularies were probably four to five times the vocabulary of the average American right now. Right. Their vocabulary was unbelievable. And the reason it was because their education system taught them vocabulary. They, they didn't just know uh, 47 words. They knew thousands of words, and they knew what those words meant. Now, watch this. They also knew what they meant from a biblical perspective. That's critical. They looked through life through a biblical lens. Okay? And one of the first things that I would say in this thing of teaching is you've got to learn to look at life and everything through a biblical lens. When you hear a news story, do you look at it through a biblical lens? When you hear something, do you hear it through a biblical filter? This is critical in teaching and learning, and this is how you want to teach your children. You need to teach your children to see life through a biblical lens. If you don't, they'll get secularized, and it, and it happens. People sit in church for 30 years, and their mind is secular because they do not see life through a biblical lens. They don't filter all the information and the noise and everything that's coming through them and the circumstances and the people that they're meeting and the situations that are occurring. They're not filtering them through a biblical lens. Now, the way that you filter through a biblical lens is you've got to be able to read the Bible. Okay? So now I wanted to put up 1 John, before we even get started today, I want to put up 1 John chapter, uh, <clears throat> let's go 1 Corinthians 2. Joel, I want to apologize. I probably should have got you guys a list, but I'm not sure where I'm going myself. So blind lead to blind wall, fall in the ditch. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and let's go to verses 13 through 16. Now, and turn your Bibles there, mark these, and write these scriptures down. Now, these two passages I'm going to give you are very critical passages. And I want to say again to you. If you have trouble reading, do not be ashamed of that in the sense that you don't want anybody to know it. 
Just come to grips with it. Say, you know what? I'm not a good reader. I might not have had the best training. Maybe I wasn't interested, but I want to read the Bible. I knew a man who got saved late in life, probably in his 40s, and he literally did not know how to read. And he wanted to read the Bible so badly, he, he learned how to read it at the age of 40-some years old. And, was able, and I literally heard him read the Bible. Don't get down on yourself. Don't crawl back in the closet and hide and try to keep anybody from knowing that you don't know how to read. Just come to grips with it personally. You don't have to advertise it around, but say, you know what? I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to learn to read. You can learn to read. I'll tell you what you can, and I'll tell you what, it'll be a joy to you. It really will be. And uh, so anyway, let's look at this passage of Scripture. Paul said, for which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom, what? Teach it. Ask yourself this question. What I know, is it what man has taught, or is it what the Holy Spirit has taught through his word? Let me give you an illustration about this teaching through a filter. When you sit in a science class and you're told this and this and this, are you able to filter what you're being taught or said to you through the Bible? Because if you're not, you're in trouble. Yeah. Now, we're saved by believing. And what you believe, what you've received and accepted as a belief system in you, literally is determining where you spend eternity. Yeah. <clears throat> Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay, But if you don't believe, I was with a man one time witnessing. And he and I <clears throat> was in this, walked into this shop. This guy was there and, and he, he handed him a gospel track. And the guy said, hey, I don't need that. I don't believe any of that junk. And I never will forget what that man did. He took his finger and he, he was real short. He stuck it right up and he said, the Bible talks about you explicitly. And the man said, how's that? He said, Revelation 21, he said, the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone. Amen. You just said you don't believe. You're in trouble with God. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievers. What do you believe? See, because what you believe, but if, watch this. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Now, you can be saved and not know how to read. But what I'm saying is that you, if you want to expand your joy and so forth, but if you're not careful, you'll be believing things that people says or teaches without having checked it yourself. Right. Don't trust a preacher. Amen. Yep. That's right. preachers, can, preachers can go for 30, 40 years right, and all of a sudden just... Right. It happens all the time. Right. You've got to know what's the truth. You can't be placing your faith in some man. And for that reason, I mean, I, 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 the, the, the Catholic Church, all during the Dark Ages, literally a man that I had a chance to witness to, and he got saved two weeks later at my kitchen table, said, we are told, he was a Catholic, and he was aggravated at me because I uh, didn't, you know, because I preached against Catholicism. And, and he said, well, we don't read, read the Bible. They tell us not to read the Bible. That's, that's in this generation. That's not in the Dark Ages. He knew that now. He said, they don't want us to read the Bible. Why don't they want them to read the Bible? Tell me. <clears throat> they might find out that Mary can't pray for you. They might find out the Pope's not infallible. They might find out there's no place called purgatory. They might find out that there is one man, the mediator between God and man, and that that priest can't do nothing for him. You see, if they know, they know this. If they read your Bible, they'll know we're a bunch of fakos. Now, you watch this. Which things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Now, you cannot separate this book from the Holy Ghost. This book was inspired and written by the power of the Holy Ghost. Holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It is a Holy Spirit book. It's a spiritual book. It has to be comprehended received and understood and believed through the power of faith and the, by the work of the Holy Spirit in you. <clears throat> the Holy Ghost teaches, that's the, what the Bible's teaching you. In other words, here's, here's the contrast. The words which man's wisdom teacheth, evolution, Darwinism, communism, liberalism, all this junk. Or is it what the Holy Ghost has taught? Two belief systems right there. Watch this now. <clears throat> which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. We're talking about the spiritual gift of teaching. 
Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. This is one of the greatest secrets to teaching there is. Now, I'm going to show you in just a minute how God wants to be your teacher, not anybody else. Amen. I'll show you in just a little bit. But here, this is one of the greatest verses in the Bible concerning your spiritual growth and your spiritual life. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. How many has ever heard me take a New Testament passage and take you back to the Old Testament to show you an Old Testament typology of it? Or how many has ever got up here and you, somebody's preaching and they're taking you verses after verses after verses from Genesis to Revelation about that subject? <clears throat> Here's how you start comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. In other words, you look, <clears throat> if you're looking at the subject of marriage, you will start in Genesis with Adam and Eve and you'll go all the way through. And you look up everything. You compare spiritual things to spiritual. That's called rightly dividing the word of truth. <clears throat> you can keep from getting messed up this way. <clears throat> so you compare spiritual things with spiritual things. It's a Holy Spirit book. The Holy Spirit is God. Okay? Now watch this. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man is the lost man. He is not born of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> he cannot comprehend the things of God. They're foolishness unto him. You walk into an average biology class and say, I believe in creation, I believe evolution is lying. They'll laugh and scoff at you. Yeah. It's foolishness to them. America has become a nation of where believing in hell is like foolish to them. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw a comment on one of my posts this, this morning where a guy is talking about, oh, you guys believe all that junk if you want to, and uh, you're just going to live 80 years and that's it. There's no afterlife, nothing like that. I mean, it's just, he, he just, basically, what was he saying? He said exactly what the Bible says. It's all foolishness. You're not going to face God after death and all this kind of stuff, see? Fool he, the world thinks it's foolishness. Now watch this. For all you folks who don't believe you're supposed to judge anybody, get this verse. But he that is spiritual, who is he that is spiritual? He's a saved man who's rightly dividing and comparing spiritual things with spiritual, who knows what the Bible says about a subject. Okay? He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yeah. And when this wicked, sorry, low down crowd tells you, don't be judging me, you tell them God said to. Yeah. <clears throat> Doesn't mean you're to judge them with the attitude of condemning them to hell that, that you don't even want them to be saved. Or to destroy their life. That's not the judgment. When, Je when Jesus said in Matthew 7, judge not that you be not judged. He's talking about an attitude when you judge that, that is, that you, you're not saying what you're saying to help the person. You're saying what you're saying to drive them to despair and to drive them away from God. And God doesn't want you doing that. Yep. What God wants us to do is make, let me tell you something. You better be judging all the time. You better be judging me while I'm teaching this morning. Amen. Yeah. So don't ever buy into this, well, I can't judge anybody. That's a lie out of hell. And that is literally the biggest lie out of hell I know going on in this country right now. Oh, well, you better not judge him. You shouldn't be judging him. Well, you know, we've all sinned. That's all right. We've all sinned. If you don't get saved, we're all going to hell. Right. Don't get swallowed up in that lie. Yeah. Now, here, give me an example. <clears throat> that, that is an example of not rightly dividing the word of truth nor comparing spiritual things to spiritual things. Did you ever notice that's the only verse on judging they ever pull out? Yeah. Yeah. And there's dozens of other verses like that that tells you that, uh, that you're supposed to judge. Yeah. The Bible said if you have a problem in church, you're supposed to get the, uh, uh, the ones in church that are least esteemed to judge. I mean, the Bible's just full. <clears throat> and here's the lie of it. When, if you tell me not to judge, you're judging me. Right. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. It's a, it's a built-in lie. Yeah. Amen. So I just want to encourage you today. You've got to know the Bible. Amen. You've got to know it. If you don't know it, 
you get sucked into the whirlwind of this world's secular thinking and you, your thinking will get so messed up, you'll justify any sin out there. That's right. You'll twist yourself around just like Eve did to where it's all right. Now, so let's look at this thing. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Hmm. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Watch this. If we judge ourselves, if we'll judge ourselves, the Bible said, we'll not be judged. Now, let me tell you something you need to do. Get your life in such a way that you have moved under, watch this, the judgment of God. Let me tell you what most people's trouble is. <clears throat> They're far more concerned about how other people judge them than they are about how God's judging them. And can I tell you something? Man cannot, without that book, cannot righteously and justly judge anybody. And you'll get yourself so messed up mentally and spiritually by being more concerned about how people are judging me. This is what happens to preachers. Watch this. Preachers get to where they're more concerned how the congregation is judging them than they are about how God is judging them. And when they do that, they're sunk. Gone. Yes, Brother Phil. Careful, too, in our judgment that we're not putting ourselves out better than others. But, you know, in humility... <laughs> You know, with humility. Exactly. There's a self right you can you can build self righteousness into it, you know, where I'm better than you. that's but that's not what this is about. This is about all right, I want to ask you here's what's crazy to me. How many here thinks rape's wrong? Yeah, How many thinks how many thinks somebody abduct a child, molest that child, slit its throat and throw it in a ditch, how many thinks it's wrong? Who are you to judge? Yeah, exactly. Who are you to judge? Who says that's wrong? Do you see where I'm coming at? So now we've got all this same-sex marriage. Well, who are you to judge? Now you've got all these sodomites and transgenders and all this craziness. And they've got their selective judgments. And their selective judgments all about they're their own God who sets their own rules. See, they've removed themselves out from underneath the authority of God's word, and they decide. That's what judge, the book of Judges ends with this statement. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And when you get yourself there, you're in big, big trouble. You better be more concerned about what's right in God's eyes, not in your eyes or other people's eyes. <clears throat> Go ahead. But, but it's an abomination to God to be like that and to be gay and, and exactly. to act like that. It's different than just a regular sin. I've had it to is. explain that to people. And if we use the word of God, it separates the truth. And this is the judge. Yeah. I'm just delivering the exactly. message. Exactly. That's the whole thing. If I don't judge based on, under the authority of God's word, then it's just my word against you. Right. All right. Now. Here's what we're talking about, teaching and reading. Learn how, learn how to read. Watch verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? This is it. <clears throat> what does God say about this issue? What does God say about this sin? Who hath known the, how do you know the mind of the Lord? The Bible said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How do you get there? This book. That's how you get there. That book. <clears throat> okay. I want you to go to 1 John. Now I'm going to give you something wonderful. This is joyful. <clears throat> How many knows there was a liquor in the, in the Civil War days called OB Joyful? <laughs> there was. That was the name of it. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. It was, <clears throat> the world always has its substitute joy. Amen. All right. 1 John chapter 2, verse number. Uh, let's go to verse 30, uh, 25. You're there. This is the promise that he hath promised us even what? Eternal life. These things have been written in you concerning them that do what? Seduce you. What are they seducing? What are they seducing you about? He's talking about your beliefs. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. Can you believe that verse? 
Well, I thought the Bible said we, there's gifts of teaching. There is. Yes. And there's a place for it. And there's a need for it. But I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> if you were in prison and nobody ever came to that prison to minister to you, could you take a Bible and could you teach, could you learn the Word of God? You sure could. Now watch this. How? By the anointing. Anytime you see the word anointing in the Bible, it's talking about the Holy Ghost of God. The oil that they anointed with was symbolic of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you something about the gift of teaching. That without anointing, it is just head stuff. Just head stuff. There has to be an anointing. And with that anointing comes several things. There's inspiration, there's preservation, there's illumination. Yes, when the Holy Spirit, and the, here's the prayer David prayed in the testing. He said, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And the Holy Spirit of God, as you read and you pray and say, Lord, open my eyes, and as you, watch this, compare spiritual things to spiritual things. The Lord will begin to illuminate your mind and show you things that will rock your soul. That will do something to you that no man can take from you because no man gave it to you. Yes, sister. I got to witness to an older gentleman um, that had been a patient of mine. He was in a... Uh, senior citizen home mm -hmm. and he that we were talking and so I told him I'd come back when I wasn't working and I did and I gave him some tracks and stuff and he said oh he'd read the Bible like three or four times cover to cover mm -hmm. but um, he didn't I explained the gospel to him plan of salvation and he didn't accept while I was there but later on I actually had a man from our church go with me and they were visiting and he told him he said oh he said I did I followed that track and he had accepted Christ and he said now I actually understand he said I didn't know nobody ever told me yeah. and it was amazing but that's like what you're saying it just opened the word of God to him after he was anointed with the Spirit. exactly the, the salvation is a work of the Spirit Amen. you can't see it until the Holy Spirit illuminates your mind I, I will tell you that the gospel is, is based around the, the great subject of substitution it is so ingrained in our culture, in our religions, in our own fleshly heart and minds to earn our way or to somehow or another merit our way partially at least into heaven. That it's very hard sometimes for the Holy Spirit to break through and make you see that all of your righteousness, all of my righteousness is as filthy rags and that I need a Savior. And that Savior died in my place for my sin and paid for my sin. And that is where grace comes in. And all of a sudden you begin to understand grace. It's not how well I'm living. It's not what I don't do in these things. It's grace. And let me just tell you about true biblical grace. <clears throat> Once grace comes through the enlightenment and the illumination of the Holy Spirit to a heart, the transformation that is done by the power of the Holy Ghost is something out of this world. <clears throat> it can take a man who has no desire to go to church to can't hardly wait till Sunday gets here. It can make a man who never enjoyed anybody singing Amazing Grace literally lift his head toward heaven and say, Oh God, thank you for grace. I want to tell some of you this morning what you're missing is grace. You've been taught everything. You know, you know it all, but, but, you, but the grace of God has not worked in your heart and you're just fighting God you're just fighting God you're just fighting you you, you really I mean you you want that world to like you you're more concerned about the world loving you and liking you and approving you and accepting you than you are about God and I'm telling you something when grace comes you'll let the world float away Jim now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace but of debt but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, with justify, justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. That's it. And, you know, but this is why <clears throat> everything that we do has to be done through the power of the Holy Spirit, this anointing. And I'm just telling you this. If, I just want to encourage you in this thing of teaching that this. 
The anointing which you received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things in his truth, and is no lie, and even as it is taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we shall may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So anyway, I just want to encourage you today that you can take a Bible. Here's what I'd encourage you to do. Let's, uh, I want to, we talked about <clears throat> this morning, what time is it, 10, 20? Okay. We're talking about, first of all, in this deal of teaching, learn how to read and learn how to read well. Learn how to comprehend what you're reading and build your vocabulary, okay? But you build your vocabulary by, by reading. You run across a word you don't know. <clears throat> I had a man one time trying to tell me that the King James Bible had mistakes in it. And I said, well, what, name me one. He said, well, the word purloin over in the book of First Peter. He said, that shouldn't be there. I said, who told you that? Who are you to say purloin? Well, nobody knows what it means in this generation. I said, you know why they don't know what it means? Because they won't look it up. But I said, what's funny to me is that you'll go into class over here and the teacher tells you to look up a word you don't know. And you're fine with that. Yeah. But you run across a word you don't know in the Bible and you claim the Bible's out of, out of date because you don't know the word. Right. You're a hypocrite. Right. You're just a hypocrite. Right. You challenge, you, you, you make God out to be a liar because you don't know the meaning of a word, but yet you go over here to some stupid little science class and they tell you to look up some word and you're happy to do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, the problem is not here, it's here. Purloining means to steal, to take that which is not yours. And it won't hurt you to look it up in the dictionary. So here's what I want to tell you. Hang on, Terry. You get an authorized King James Bible, which is the Word of God, the preserved Word of God. You get a 1828 dictionary. And there is a reason for that because of the dictionaries that are in print now have left out all biblical connection, yep. Yep. biblical definition of anything. And the 1828 dictionary was the dictionary that took us through all the early years of this nation. And people, they understood and defined words from a biblical perspective. When you look up a word in that dictionary, it will not only give you the, the, the secular definition of that word, it will give you biblical references where that word is used and how it was used so that you have a broad context of that word. So you get a Bible and you get an 1828 dictionary and you get you a good concordance. Now I'm not going to tell you which one to get, just get you a good concordance. Don't, pay, don't go back and read a bunch of stupid junk. They just, the concordance is how you look up words. Let's say that you were thinking of, you're thinking of the word sea. Jesus walked upon the sea. You want to look up all the words about sea, S-E-A. And so you look up the word sea in a concordance. It's just like a dictionary. It's in alphabetical order. And you come down through the sea, and it's going to have all the verses from Genesis to Revelation with the word sea in it. So then you go back to your Bible and get your notebook out and your pen, and you start in Genesis, and you, you do a study on the word sea. Uh, if some of you kids, if you like horses, go in the Bible and look up horses. It's an amazing study. Guess what? Jesus is coming back on a white horse. If you like horses, you ought to like Jesus. Amen? He likes horses too. But you go back and every, here's, here's true learning. Here's true wisdom. Here's true knowledge. Look at life through the biblical perspective. This is why public education is rotting this country because they, nothing is looked through in a biblical perspective. It's all secular, human-minded. And you vacuum that out, and all you're going to have is human rot left to you. It's not hard, it's not hard to figure out. Just the truth. People don't, people don't like it. I can't help it. <clears throat> Can I tell you, Jesus is supposed to be preeminent in all things. Amen. He'd be preeminent in my marriage, preeminent in my house, preeminent in my work, preeminent in business, preeminent in this church, preeminent in education, preeminent in every government, preeminent in everything. And by the way, someday he will be. Amen. He'll be preeminent in everything. So let's look at that verse. Oh, that's okay. He took that down. Um, we're going to pick up last week where we talked about the characteristics of, of uh, teaching. Let's run down through them a little bit. Number one, a teacher needs to, uh, to validate information, and that's good. You want to validate information. Check it out. The misuse of that, he become proud of knowledge. <clears throat> and if you have the gift of teaching and you can read, I'll just stop and say this. I've seen people proud of how well they could read and understand. And that's wrong. If you could read and comprehend, you just humbly thank God that you can. Yes. Don't lord it over somebody that can't. And don't use that power over it, okay? Second, second thing is they like to check out teachers. They don't just assume it's okay. They want to check them out. 
The misuse of that is they despise the lack of credentials. This is everywhere in churches. Most churches in America right now will not hire a preacher if he doesn't have doctorate degrees and all this stuff. They don't think he's qualified. That's, that's unscriptural as it could possibly, possibly be. First of all, Jesus said, don't put flattering titles on yourself. And by the way, where, where, did, where did we get it? Where did we get it that a preacher is supposed to be called doctor? Where's that at in the Bible? And what happens is they have a contempt. And it's that old doctor of the Nicolaitans. Nico conquer the La Laetines, the laity. The, 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 they conquer the laity by, watch this, knowledge and information. I'm the, when this is why they all get up and talk Greek and Hebrew all the time. Because they know the average person doesn't know it. But if I can get up here and say, well, in the Greek, that Greek word is blah, blah, blah. And that Hebrew word is blah, blah, blah. I go, oh, man, that guy knows Hebrew. No, he don't. If he knows it, ask him to preach a message with it. Don't use any English. You'll never say nothing to me. You'll never say nothing to me about your Hebrew and Greek unless you can get up and preach explicitly in Hebrew and in Greek and never use an English word. Otherwise, you're a hypocrite. Amen. Because all you're trying to do is lord it over people by your knowledge of the Greek and your knowledge of the Hebrew. Hey, I got news for you. I got an English Bible and it tells me what it means and means what it says. And if I don't know a word, I can look it up. Amen. I don't need your Greek. I don't need your Hebrew. Nobody, nobody in this country, nobody in this nation, nobody in this world right now is being saved and born again in the Spirit of God by listening to some yo-yo preach Greek. Amen. And if you can find it, you show me where it's at. Yeah. Nobody, nobody's being saved by a bunch of Greek and Hebrew scholars who hate this book. Yeah. Nowhere. Show me, show me a man who preaches Greek and Hebrew leading anybody to Jesus Christ in this world. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me mad. I don't care. You say, that's unholy. I'll, I'll ask God to forgive me after church. Amen. <laughs> but it makes me, stirs me up. Why? Because people are dying and going to hell. Right. While they pretend that they love them and, and lord their intellectualism over them. Yeah. Makes me sick to my stomach. I'd rather have a guy that don't know how to read but knows Jesus and tell me how Christ died for my sins. How Christ's blood was shed for me. And tell me and warn me and say, Reggie, I love you enough to tell you if you don't get saved, you're going to bust hell wide open. I can't read very good, but I know Christ. Amen. This intellectualism has killed this country. There's a lot of difference between education and intellectualism. Third thing is they'll rely on established resources. If you want to write something down there, just write down that there is an established resource. It's called the Authorized King James Bible. I've got a lot of books in my library. I'm on a lot of them. Not one, not one stinking book in that whole library I can trust. It's the only book I've got that I can trust. The rest of them, you read them long enough, you'll find out they start slipping in their unbelief. And the printing world and the book selling world is chunk full of this stuff. There might be a book or two in there. I, I don't know. I can't think of right now if it is. The third thing that happened to a teacher is they'll just they'll depend on human reasoning if they're not careful. And they'll fail to see their need to bring their intellect underneath the authority of the Holy Spirit. And this is a powerful thought. And I so appreciate this booklet bringing that out. Let me just tell you something. When you're reading your Bible, when you're trying to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, when you're trying to live for the Lord, you have to submit your mind to that book. You cannot place your mind over it and say, well, if it agrees with what I think, then I'll accept it. But if it doesn't, I won't. God will just, he'll just shut you off. He'll just literally, the Holy Spirit will pull back. You won't learn nothing of value, of truth. Because you're too, you're too proud, you're too cocky. I'm going to tell you something, he's God. He's God Almighty. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. We are born, for, we are created for his glory, for his purpose. There's no other purpose under the sun to live except for Jesus Christ. And he's God Almighty in his word. By the way, you're going to be judged by this word. The books were opened. The books were opened. Uh, number four, he presents truth systematically. And that is a good thing. People need systematic teaching. In other words, you know, orderly teaching that, that gathers together. And, uh, but the, 
Opposite of that, misuse of they'll criticize practical applications. Don't ever criticize practical applications. This week there's a tree that's just over the fence from my yard a couple, three, four years ago. That tree uh, broke off during a windstorm and it exposed that that tree's heart was rotten. And when I saw that tree and the limb had broke off from it there and it, it literally ripped it so down through it that it, it, the tree is like standing on two legs with a hole in the middle. And uh, I thought to myself, when I saw that tree, I thought, man, that thing, that's just like a person's heart, heart. It may look good on the outside, but when it's cracked open, God exposes the rottenness on the inside. And oftentimes we wonder what happened to people. They looked good on the outside, but their heart was bad. And when the winds and the storms of life came and it exposed the open, it broke it open, they could see it. Okay. And I literally, this is such a wonderful thing, this, I literally thought, well, that tree will die. <clears throat> I actually thought about taking the chainsaw and just cutting it down. Well, I didn't get it done. The other day I was taking out driving on side to side to go somewhere there. And I looked, and that tree was just gorgeous with the leaves on it. It was beautiful. And I looked down, and I that stupid tree, it didn't give up. It's got a hole. I literally, it's got a, you can stick my hand through that tree. It's got a hole in the middle of it. Now, my concept was, well, the heart of it shot, so it's, there's no hope for it. And man, I tell you, when I just stopped my side by side and I jumped out and I just walked up that thing and I took a picture. I put it on Facebook. Do you know there's been 1,400 and some shares of that picture? <laughs> and why? why? Because the t tree is teaching a very practical lesson of a spiritual truth Amen. that you may have had bad internal problems in the past. And God may have exposed that and ripped that all apart. But he's not done with you. Amen. And you can bear fruit and you can be beautiful and so unique. Yeah. See, that tree, well, I can tell you what it did. Its roots. And what you got to do is just go down for the grace. Amen. You got to get low and say, God, I need grace. I got to get a hold of the water of God's grace. Now, here's what I'm getting to. If you're not careful in teaching, you'll think facts, 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 facts. And this is where so many people say, yeah, so-and-so is a good teacher, but he's dull as rocks. You ever, you ever, you ever been around that? Yeah. A lot of information, but... Let me tell you, how, how did Jesus teach? Parables, analogies, constantly, constantly. All through the Gospels, he used analogies. RJ's back here. I'll aggravate you, RJ. Cut a lot of logs together. Every once in a while, we'll throw a log up there. Boy, it just looks wonderful. Man, you're just all excited about getting this beautiful beam out of it. Just happened this week, didn't it? We was cutting it. He was cutting this beam. He was cutting. Boy, just about getting ready to throw it off the deck. And he rolled the side up, and that board had cut, and that thing was rotten on the inside. Let me tell you something that you need to do, especially raising your children. Every day, every time, every go around, whatever you're doing, look for an analogy to teach them a spiritual truth there everywhere around you. And every time I, every time I see a log like that, you, oh, it looked really good, you know, and you cut it open and it's just rotten and the ants start crawling out of it and it ain't worth a dime for nothing except throw it away. I think about myself, oh God. Don't let my heart get like that. And teach by analogy. Jesus said, behold, watch this. You, some of you may be worried financially this morning. You know what he said? Behold the fowls of the air. The Heavenly Father feeds them. How much more we take care of you? Behold the lilies. He's just constantly, you know, giving parables and so forth, and teaching spiritual truth through practical, in your front of your eyes, analogy. And I would just encourage you, some of the greatest teaching you'll do that'll ever really help somebody is just through analogy, through practical application. And uh, 
um, you know, and, and the Bible's just full of it. <clears throat> well, we'll go on through here. Number five, I believe is, yeah, he'll gather many facts, and that's good to do. The misuse is they may try to show off their research skills and, again, uh, be boring to people, dull. Uh, number six, we pick up from where we left off last week. A teacher will require thoroughness. A teacher enjoys giving details that are not noticed or mentioned by others. Luke gives precise descriptions of events, conversations, circumstances, physical conditions. He detailed more names, more titles, more cities and dates and events than any other gospel writer. Karen and I are in our morning Bible reading are in Luke right now. And let me tell you, Luke's got long chapters. <laughs> it does. How many has ever uh, had your morning devotion and you really need to get going and you hit a long chapter? <laughs> that shows your spirituality and glory, doesn't it? Oh, no, this chapter's got 63 verses. We're never going to get out of it. I'm going to be late. But it's okay. And that's why you need to set apart time for the Lord. Um, requires thoroughness. Uh, number six, across from there, rejecting spirit, uh, scriptural presuppositions. And you always got to understand that uh, foundational truths of scripture are to be understood by faith. There's just a lot of things I have to believe God about and I ain't got figured out. <sighs> number seven, a teacher can be uneasy with subjective truth. A teacher is concerned the truth be presented in balance. And that's so important. He recognizes the danger of using personal experience. Now, everybody, I want everybody to pay attention right here. Number seven there where it says uneasy with subjective truth. How many people's there? Say amen. Yeah. I mean, very many. How many people's there? Uneasy with subjective truth. Amen. If you're not there, get this. A teacher recognizes the danger of using personal experience as a foundation for truth. Amen. Never use personal experience as a foundation for truth. You use scripture as a foundation for truth, not experience. You don't have an experience and then try to have... Let me give you an example. <clears throat> I couldn't wait till Sunday to get here. I just got to tell you what happened to me this week. I was caught up to the third heaven. I saw things unlawful to be uttered. What would you think, sister, if I told you that? You don't know. But then what if I told you, well, don't tell me I didn't have that happen. Paul had it happen. You know what I would, <laughs> you know what I would say if I was out there and the government got up and said that? I'd say, so what? You might have went to fifth heaven. Who cares? <clears throat> Did I throw you a little curve there? Be careful about having an experience and then going looking for a passage of Scripture to justify that experience. Amen. Now, I'm just going, don't get mad at me, but if you told me you got caught up to third heaven and you saw everything, I don't, I'm not going to believe you. Yeah. I'm going to think you ate too much bologna and onions before you went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the truth. I ain't going to believe you. Why am I not going to believe you? Somebody tell me. Why would I not believe you? Why would I not believe you? Because next week, Jim might come and say, Reggie, <clears throat> God lifted me up, flew me over to South America, and I won five guys to Christ, and, and then he lifted me up and brought me back and set me down, and I, there, there my wife was. Yeah. And I said, Jim, are you sure? You don't believe my experience? <laughs> there you, go. you see, we're a little bit afraid. We're, we don't want people to think that we don't believe them. Right. We don't want to hurt their feelings, right? But you're going to have to hurt somebody's feelings along the way. Yeah, right. <clears throat> Here's the deal. If I accept the first one, then I accept the next one. If I accept that one, I accept the next one. And pretty soon I'm just out there and anything's happened to anybody and it's all supposed to be of God. Yeah. You always go from Scripture to experience, not from experience to Scripture. It's dangerous. Anything outside of Scripture is very, very dangerous. Yes, Don. Danny Douglas from Mona Ferris went to the third heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine you're right. I imagine you're right. Okay. Uh, the, the danger of that is they put their mind above the Holy Spirit, okay? And they tend to trust on it. Number eight, 
They persevere with accepted teachers. A teacher tends to remain loyal to a mentor or a school as long as any truth remains. And that's true. He does what he can to promote truth. Luke demonstrates amazing loyalty to Paul. It's absolutely, did you know what Paul said in 2 Timothy? Only Luke is with me. Luke remained loyal to the end. He was the only guy with Paul in prison before they killed Paul. And uh, the opposite of that, misuse of is taking teaching to extremes and imbalance. And, and this, is, this is why learning spiritual gifts is so important because if, if I'm not careful, I, I, I'll just, I'll, I'll overemphasize preaching on sin and judgment and so forth. I need to be balanced. You need to, have, you need to hear messages on God's mercy and on God's love and on God's forgiveness. Amen. You have to have ba scriptures balanced. I need to be balanced. It's not all about... Now, here's the thing about this. If you've got a preacher that's a mercy or a teacher that's a mercy or even a parent that's a mercy and they're like, everything's all right. It's, it, there's nothing wrong with anything. Right. And you, that needs to be balanced. That's why often God has people marry that are opposites. Because yeah. they're designed to balance. It's not so you can fight every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so that you can complement each other. Yeah. Amen? Amen? It's the truth. You know what? I mean, honest to goodness, if, if you've got one parent that's very, you know, stern and very black and white, I mean, it's truth and, I mean, every, every little issue is... You know, you better not be lying to me, you know. Well, some t you need that balance over there to say, hey, you know, how many ever seen a situation where you thought your kids did this, but you've learned the whole truth after a while, and your kids, it wasn't the way you thought it was at all? Yeah. yeah. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established, amen? And we can assume things that are not that way. Well, we'll try to wrap up here. Number nine, a uh, teacher will clear, likes to clarify misunderstandings. And if a teacher learns his facts are wrong, which they evidently weren't facts, <laughs> he will not simply accept the conclusion, but wanted to retrace his own investigations to determine where he got off the right track. And um, the, uh, the misuse of that is arguing over minor points. And I want to say something here about this. Never allow yourself to get in a confrontational, argumentative, divisive situation over minor points. Somebody said, well, it wasn't minor to me. <clears throat> the Bible has a subject called doubtful disputations. Yeah. And what that is, is it was about, remember how some of them thought it was okay to buy meat at the, uh, at the butcher houses of the pagans, that meat had been offered to idols, and some said, no, we can't do that at all. And Paul had to deal with this. There are some things that other people may not be convicted about that you are. That's just the truth. Say amen right there. Amen. <clears throat> now, there are, but, but now watch this. Don't use a doubtful disputation to excuse a sin. Yeah. That's the danger. Don't make something that is fundamentally true in Scripture a doubtful disputation. Does that make more sense? Yeah. Don't take something that's very clear in Scripture that this is wrong, and you say, well, that's a doubtful disputation. We can disagree and, and both be fine about that. No. For instance, the virgin birth. Yeah. You say, well, I, I just don't believe in virgin birth. Well, you can't be a Christian not believe in the virgin birth. That's not a doubtful disputation. Now, eating meat offered to idols is. Okay. There are things that are not doubtful disputations, that are fundamental, absolute truth. Thou shall not murder. <coughs> Thou shall not commit adultery. Those are not doubtful disputations. Right. They're just, the, they're, that's it. They're truths that need to be. How many got to watch? Uh, I, I want to tell you something. This nation, somebody this nation owes a debt of gratitude to. And that's a man by the name of Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas, after all these rulings, was asked to speak at the American Heritage, and I think that will get this right. But he made this statement. And I can tell you something. I don't know who taught this guy this, but you remember this while I'm preaching today. Somebody, when that guy was young, instilled some very, very critical guide points in that man's life. <clears throat> and he made a decision somewhere in his life 
that he was going to adhere. And he, he's, it's just a short thing, but he says this truth, if it is truth, will always be truth. He said, you can be in a hurricane. North is still north. You can be in a storm. North is still north. Me being in a storm of life does not make north go away. He said, you can be in a tornado. North is still north. You can be in a financial storm. North is still north. There's nothing in your world that's going to happen that's going to make the north not be north. God's built it into the universe. And he said, people can holler at you. North is still north. People can hate you. North is still north. People can yell at you. North is still north. People may lie on you. North is still north. People may demonize you and carve you out to be a devil. They did that with Jesus, by the way, but he was still Jesus. They can twist your words, your intents, everything, but north is still north. Don't ever forget that. And when we're teaching, <clears throat> let me just tell you something. This is why teaching is such, I've spent two weeks on this one here because it's such a critical gift. Because what's being taught to this generation Amen. is going to determine where this generation winds up at. Amen. North is still north. Yeah. That Bible's still true. Amen. Right is still right and wrong is, will always, it doesn't matter. Here's, 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 what, here's what I'm getting to. Watch this. You got people all over this country right now. <clears throat> You've got parents who at one time knew where North was. But they got a child or a grandchild got into in sodomy. And now they're not sure where North's at. They're not sure where North's at anymore. Well, you know that you know, they're just not sure. They knew divorce was wrong. But they're not sure where North's at now. They knew that lying was wrong, but they're not sure where North is now. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you know where North is? Do you know where North's at? And when you're teaching your kids, you better be sure that you taught them where North is and that there is a North. I dare you to go by a compass today. It don't matter where you turn, north is still north. It don't matter what storms are blowing. That Bible is still God's word, still true. It always will be. It doesn't matter. Hey, if I blow out, the Bible's still true. Right. Let's stand together. Come on, get your songbook today. And uh, pandas, come and we're going to sing, worship God today. And thank the Lord that north is still north. Amen. When you're teaching your family, be sure that you get them to understand these great truths. All righty. Bob, how are you this morning? Still all right. Still all right. How old are you, Bob? 84. Man kind of forgets when he gets that old, don't he? He was cutting trees at Camp Joy yesterday. He was cutting trees at Camp Joy yesterday. Bob, I appreciate you so much. And I want some of you young, I'm going to tell you young kids something, some of you young boys. You ought to get acquainted with that man. Amen. You ought to start learning. Say, you know what, I'm going to learn something that man, 84 years old, still out cutting trees and wanting to serve God and be a practical help to people. Would you dismiss us from our service this morning to our singing time? Bob, would you do that? Go worship you, continue to praise you, the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, come on, let's sing.